demystify, dissect, and really just give the basics of oncology, a rapidly evolving and ever-changing discipline in the medical field. My name is Josh, and as always, I'm joined my, by my illustrious co-host, Dr. Michael Fernando. This week, we have a two-part special. And we're going to be talking about neuro-oncology for all you budding neurologists, neurosurgeons, neuro-oncologists, and neurophysiologists. This is the episode for you where we go into GBMs, astrocytomas, and meningiomas as a overlying example. But it's a difficult topic because there's lots of nuances and not a lot of research. Isn't that right, Michael? You're absolutely right, Josh. Uh, GBMs and... CNS tumors are really something that if you're in a lot of places, you never see, um, especially where we work uh, or where I work in Australia in, and in Melbourne. The, um, there are only a handful of centers that will actually deal with these. And if you have, uh, uh, if you're from anywhere else and you are unfortunate enough to have one of these cancers, you're shipped off to a, to a so-called capable center. So, some of our listeners may never have dealt with a CNS tumor of any kind, uh, so it is important that you at least know the basics. And that is a service that we at Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind are happy to provide. That's exactly it. And we'll get right into it today. And I'll start off with malignant gliomas, the background. So gliomas, would you describe that, Michael, as like an overarching term that people use? I would, Josh. I would indeed. Thanks. Well, it's it's actually confusing when they like people are like it's a glioma, but is it a GBM? And just just a kind of nomenclature is so important. So gliomas account for the great majority of CNS tumors, so central nervous system tumors. Yearly, the incidence of malignant gliomas are about three to five per one hundred thousand. And for me, that works at a tertiary center that deals with this, we see a lot more. There is a slight male predominance, and The thing is, it can happen at any ages. I've seen people that are 18 or 19 that have, you know, these terrible gliomas, and I've seen people who are in their 70s and 80s. But interestingly, the peak incidence is in the fifth and sixth decade of life, and there are some risk factors, so exposure to ionizing radiation and hereditary syndrome, such as Lynch, Lee Fraumeni's, Cowden syndrome, and neurofibromatosis type 1. Moving forward, let's talk a little bit about the different types of cells. We'll put up a couple of slides just so people can have a look. But you've got ependymal cells. So what are they? They're columnar epithelium that line the ventricular system and spinal canal. Then you've got the microglial cells. They're macrophages of the brain. So they kind of chomp and eat up all the debris and bad stuff. You've got the oligodendrocytes. They, they form myelin sheets in the CNS. I consider that like the electricity pathways in the brain. And then you've got the astrocytes. So their structure, they regulate neuronal transmissions. They're the metabolic support. They're the transmitter uptake and release and the vasomodulators, et cetera. So they're the little men and women that kind of make sure everything works the way it should. But Josh, every family has a problem child. Or a handful of problem children. So uh, the vast majority of uh, brain tumours, what cell types do they derive from? Astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, Michael. But here's a question. The two black sheep of the brain. Black sheep of the brain. How do do we classify, Michael? Because this is really confusing. And I don't even know if we'll do it justice on our podcast. And it's even more confusing now that the... uh, criteria have only recently been updated so if you know uh, anything about this take all your knowledge and throw it in the dustbin that's it and i'm going to just briefly talk about how you differentiate them so you've got cns who to world health organization grades and they go from grade one to grade four how how do you sort of separate them so astrocytomas you look for certain mutations so that includes idh mutations um whether they're sort of mutant or wild type, and it's the amount of de-differentiation that you sort of see. And then you've got oligodendrocytes, and they have cer- certain types of deletions to their chromosomes. So one, like a grade two would have a 1P forward slash 19Q co-deletion, and a grade three would also have that same deletion. So it's all a bit confusing, isn't it, Michael? 
It is. And it's important to say that we're going to throw out a lot of acronyms and a lot of seemingly random combinations of numbers and letters, which can be quite difficult to visualize in a podcast form. But never fear, because in the uh, episode description, we will include a handy flowchart that enables you, our dear listeners, to follow the different mutations and see in a visual capacity uh, what they represent. So that when you're seeing these patients in clinic and they have a, that they have like a grade four astrocytoma and then they have all of these letters, their IDH mutant to... uh, uh, recount Josh, they've uh, l- they've uh, got EGFR mutations, or they've got they've lost their um, ATRX, or they've got a TERP promoter. TIB. They've got a TERP promoter. They've got a this. They've got a that. Um, it will all be contained in a easy flowchart. So don't worry if it gets a bit difficult and confusing to follow on. Yeah. Just to give you a bit of an example of why we care. So if we look at IDH mutation. To that stands for isocitrate dehydrogenase. This is actually a good thing when it comes to molecular markers and prognosis. Um, it confers a significantly improved prognosis. So for a diagnostic purpose, it can distinguish infiltrating astrocytoma cells from reactive gliosis in a biopsy specimen. What that means is that when you look at the stuff under a microscope, it's hard to tell if it's A or B and you need these kind of things. It's a defining feature of the majority of grade 2 and grade 3 diffuse astrocytic and oligodendroglial tumors. And when observed in high-grade tumors, it suggests that the tumor has developed from a lower-grade precursor lesion. So they kind of go up the grades as they get more aggressive. Another example of, I guess, a good, inverted commas, uh, mutation is a 1P19Q code deletion. So complete deletion of the short short arm of chromosome 1 and the long arm of chromosome 19. You're like, oh, Josh, I'm so bored. Trust me, don't be. It's great. Now, molecular it's a molecular genetic signature of an oligodendrocytoma, and it has a more favorable prognosis than a diffuse glioma. So it, it's, it's difficult to, to conceptualize. So imagine if you've just got a blank astrocytoma or, you know, you've got a, a, just a blank oligodendrocytes what you then add and what you need if you're in an MDT is you want to know what mutations they have because that will influence what treatment options you give and the conversation that you end up having with the patient. Does that sort of, yep. Moving forward, we'll also talk about MGMT methylation status. And no, I'm not talking about the band. There's, There's a band called MGMT? Oh, you're so old. Probably from like... 15 years ago. Uh, for, for GBMs, tumor specimens should be tested for MGMT, which is a 6 methyl guanine DNA methyltransferase promoter methylation. What happens is methylation of the MGMT promoter leads to gene silencing and loss of expression of the MGMT DNA repair protein. So if You've got methylation, that's good. It confers improved prognosis in high-grade gliomas and predicts benefit from L-plating agent chemotherapies. So MGMT promoter methylation observed in 50% of GBMs. So that's that's kind of the most the worst ones. And most IDH mutant GBMs show methylation of the MGMT promoter. So what we see here is that if you have a GBM, your got a 50% chance of having MGMT gene promoter methylation, which means that the MGMT no longer repairs cells. And there's also a pretty strong likelihood that you're actually going to have IDH mutant. And if you've got that, we are like, okay, your MGMT methylator positive. It means that you're probably going to respond better to the chemotherapy that I'm going to give you. And I hear some people saying, Josh, you're so interesting. You're so interesting that I've caught up on all of the sleep I've lost so far this year. Um, But when you sort of boil it down and you're talking about all of these different types of uh, CNS tumors, of which the MGMT, the IDH, all of those other markers are heavily involved in actually differentiating because you look at all of the markers and effectively at the end of the day it spits out a type of tumor and a grade what is the consequence 
of having a grade two oligodendroglioma, and I definitely didn't need to practice that before I said it, versus a grade four MGMT unmethylated um, uh, glioblastoma. When we're talking to a patient, what are the sort of, what are the simple terms we would put into it? Uh, put put all of this information into. Yeah, that's a really great question, Michael. Can you now say that five times really fast? <laughs> oh, like a dendrite. Uh, I can't even say it once. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's all about expected survival. That's that's really the baseline. If you've got a grade two astrocytoma, your median survival is seven to ten years. If you've got a grade two oligodendroglioma, you've got greater than ten to fifteen years. That's grade two. Right, so pretty pretty good. If it goes to a grade three and it's an anaplastic astrocytoma, which I think is the old nomenclature actually, that's three and a half years. An anaplastic oligodendroglioma, it's greater than ten years. Then you've got grade four, and Michael, it's it's fifteen months. You know, two year survival is twenty seven percent, and the morbidity on these patients is huge. They're on high doses of DEX all the time. They've got neuro problems with seizures. And then you look at MGMT. So remember, I was discussing that if you're MGMT methylated, you're more likely to respond to chemotherapy. And if you're MGMT unmethylated, you're less likely. So the difference here is pretty stark. So methylation, uh, median survival, 23 months, with a two-year survival of just under 50%. If you're unmethylated, so median survival is 13 months and your two-year survival is 12%. Huge changes. So you really want that MGMT methylation. And I would have loved someone to have just tapped me on the shoulder before I started to do neuro-oncology and be like, Josh, look for the MGMT. But here we are. If you don't remember anything from our talk, MGMT and grades confer overall survival. How's that, Michael? That's That's a really good summary, Josh. And I think that's the most important thing because a lot of the extra uh, markers, like I said, they are involved in the actual narrowing down of the type of tumour or the type of CNS tumour, and they can be used as a selection criteria in clinical trials. But ultimately, when when it comes down to it, you will have a pathology report that will spit out a subtype of tumour and you need to know what that means. You need to know what the consequences are. Uh, and also in the, um, in the clinical setting, how it's going to affect your treatment. That's it. Mikey, let's, let's put a scenario in, in place because I think that's the best way to sort of learn. You've got a low-grade glioma. Tell, tell me about this. Like, you know, is it a single malignancy? Is it diverse? You know, what what are the potential things? Is it benign? Is it malignant? You know, can you cure it without chemotherapy? All of these questions. So this is a low-grade glioma. So what, what grade is that? That's the first thing I'm going to ask you. <laughs> that's, that's a very good question, Josh. So low-grade gliomas, first off, to answer your, I think it was first in that barrage of questions. It's like 30, uh, 30 questions. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, question one of 30. Um, low-grade gliomas are not one type of tumour. They are a, a collection of tumours, a diverse group, some might say, of relatively uncommon malignancies. They're certainly not the headline grabbers uh, that you see frequently, tragic cases in the news of young people with, with these horrible, horrible glioblastomas are the, are the common ones. These aren't those. They account for about 5 to 10% of all CNS tumours. And there are three main types of low-grade gliomas. The ones that fall into the CNS WHO grade 1, mainly pilocytic astrocytomas, which can have BRAF mutations, but they're very rare. I'll be, very rare. I'll be honest, I've never seen one in clinical practice. I've never seen one out in the wild. The... CNS WHO grade 2 um, cancers are astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas. And the difference between these two, if you go back to our helpful uh, spreadsheet, they're both IDH mutant because if you are IDH wild type, 
as uh, we'll hear down the track, that automatically puts you into the uh, glioma or glioblastoma uh, half of the different types of uh, CNS tumors. So they're all IDH mutant. Um, Oligodendrogliomas will have their um, ATRX, which is a cell proliferation and promotion uh, a gene, uh, which is a gene that controls cell proliferation and the promotion of cellular longevity, uh, usually through the lengthening of telomeres, which are the areas of the genome which are associated with quote-unquote cell aging. And so if you have a retention, a retained ATRX, then you are an oligodendroglioma because loss of it automatically puts you into the astrocytoma. So we're sort of breaking this down a bit. So if you're IDH wild type, you're glioma. If you're, if you don't have an ATRX, you're a type of astrocytoma. And if you do have it, then you're an oligodendroglioma. And there are a number of other ways that I won't sort of harp on about because, like we said at the start, it's much easier to see this in sort of flow diagram form rather than just hearing us rabbiting on about it. But uh, those that's probably the best way to to differentiate the two. Now, they they frequently present with seizures. 81% of uh, low-grade gliomas will present with seizures, which stands to reason. If you have a mass that is obviously in an area of high concentration of neuronal pathways and you start messing with those pathways, you're going to get aberrant signals. And what are seizures if not aberrant signals? Uh, They tend to be quite slow growing. So if you're taking a history, if you're working up the patient, they will not generally have a history of symptoms over the course of weeks or short months. It'll tend to be a fairly long uh, history. Now, one question that you asked that was very interesting, Josh, is are these benign? Which is the conclusion that many would jump to. You hear low grade. um, You hear a type of uh, cancer that does not end in carcinoma. um, uh, But, uh, you know, astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma. Uh, You think benign. And when you think benign, you think you know, not dangerous. Uh, There are a couple of sort of caveats to that. The one thing that I always say to patients when I'm sort of explaining this is that a lot of CNS tumors, if they were anywhere else in the body, would not be significant problems. Even the really nasty glioblastomas would not necessarily have the horrific impact that they do on people's mortality and morbidity if they were anywhere else in the body. A big part of the problems that these cancers cause is the distinct limitations to what I call real estate. The skull, the brain cavity is obviously a very restricted area. And so the second you have anything that's starting to grow and starting to exert pressure on localized structures, you're going to have problems. It's a balloon, Michael. A balloon. It's a balloon. You know, you you can't pop. So it's just going to have problems because it's confined areas. Imagine if you keep blowing and putting pressure in a balloon, it's not going to do well. It's exactly the same with the brain cavity. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're exactly right. So I know thing, th- things, <laughs> it happens so rarely. Cancers that are relatively non-aggressive, quote unquote, in that they don't metastasize, they don't spread, they don't overwhelm the body writ large, can still do a lot of damage. However, a significant proportion, and we're talking about half of patients with low-grade glioma, can undergo an anaplastic transformation to a higher grade. And I have seen this. If you have a patient who you look through their history and they were diagnosed with a type of brain cancer 10, 15 years ago, but they've now got a very high-grade glioblastoma or something similar, you can almost guarantee that they were not diagnosed with that initially. So you can have mutations, transformations, the picking up of extra errors in these cancers that uh, can lead to a significant increase in the aggressiveness and the grade of the original tumour. Fortunately, if we catch them early enough, they're usually curable by surgery alone. 
And if there is a incomplete resection or if surgery is not feasible, which again is very dependent on the location of the original tumor, a lot of places in the brain are very inconvenient to use for, for, for want of a better phrase, very inconvenient to get to. Some of some places are impossible to get to. If you have a tumor in the basal ganglia, as an example, or deep in the brainstem, it's impossible to get to without causing significant mortality and morbidity to the patient. So if a surgery is not possible or a complete resection is not possible, then you can con- consider radiotherapy. So with grade one gliomas, as I mentioned They're usually curable by surgery alone. Grade 2 gliomas, surgery is still the backbone. The goal is to maximize the uh, volume of tumor that is removed to delay progression, improve survival, relieve symptoms, and of course to give a diagnosis. Uh, There are a couple of trials that we'll mention very, very briefly. Uh, As Josh Josh mentioned at the top, this is going to be much more of a basic sciences episode than our usual fare. But you know us, we can't get through an entire episode without mentioning at least one trial. So here's two. Uh, uh, They both have very, very exciting names, Josh. The first (laughs) one is the EORTC22845 slash MRC BR04 study, which just rolls off the tongue. So, so great. Um which was a study that looked at early versus delayed radiotherapy. So patients were randomized to receive either immediate radiotherapy or no therapy until they actually progress. So basically adjuvant versus palliative um, radiotherapy. Um, At the medium follow-up of almost eight years, so we are still looking at a significant survival time in these patients, the immediate... uh, the use of immediate post-operative radiotherapy did prolong progression-free survival uh, at 5.4 months versus... Sorry, 5.4 months. See, there's a little bit of bias for you. Uh, We're so used to uh, speaking in months that when studies are spoken of in years, we slip up. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So it did prolong progression free survival compared with the observation group initially 5.4 versus 3.7 years not months as we're so used to saying but did not affect overall survival both uh, groups had a smidge over 7 years however seizure control was better in the early radiotherapy group uh, whereas uh, more patients in the uh, observation group obviously had seizures Uh, more frequently. And the majority of patients in the no therapy group received radiotherapy at the time of progression. So 65%, which of course means that uh, 35% of patients did not receive radiotherapy at progression. And I would be interested to know, know why. So the conclusion for this study was the suggestion that radiotherapy does slow the progression of low grade glioma, but it does not prevent transformation, that very nasty anaplastic transformation that we mentioned Uh, and that uh, radiotherapy given at the time of radiological progression is equally effective. However, um, obviously there are, there is morbidity related to the, uh, the actual tumor itself that could be minimized. It's a bit of a toss up, but I guess the standard of care, unless you have a real reason to be more aggressive and treat, um, uh, with radiotherapy up front knowing that you're going to have a limited uh, amount of times you can treat these people with radiotherapy, is uh, it's generally better to delay. The other study is the adjuvant chemotherapy study, the RTOG9802, which is, again, such a great... Hey, Michael, do you, do you know what RTOG stands for, E-O-R-T-C stands for? So it's the European Oncology Research and Trials Coalition or something? Oh, it's European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer. Ah, I got the main point across. You did well. (laughs) The main point across. Um, So the uh, RTOG uh, enrolled 251 patients with a high-risk, low-grade glioma, so grade 2 gliomas who were randomly assigned to post-operative radiotherapy with or without six cycles of PCV chemotherapy, which is lamustine 
and procarbazine, which I must confess, Josh, is not something that I've really uh, used. Oh, sorry, lamustine, vincristine, and procarbazine, which is not something that I've uh, really used in my clinical practice. To be honest with you, neither have I. Like, I've used lamustine, and I think unless you do a high volume of these cancers, which we, even at a centre such as mine, probably don't, then, you know, you're probably not going to see that regimen unless you're discussing it in an MDT. Yeah, absolutely. Um, To cut a very long story short, uh, again, this is a study where the median follow-up was uh, measured in years, 11.9 years, and the combination of radiotherapy plus this triplet chemotherapy did improve both the PFS and overall survival compared with radiotherapy alone. For, if you're interested, the median overall survival was 13 versus 7 years. So you're almost doubling the uh, the overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.59. So I guess taking away from all of that, it really depends on a number of factors what you're going to do with these. But if you're going to give them treatment, if you do feel the need to be aggressive, then you should definitely consider the uh, radiotherapy plus PCV combination, especially if you've got a high risk low grade glioma. That's a it's a good conclusion, Michael. It's a difficult topic to talk about. Yes, especially when you're tongue tied like I apparently am today. Josh, we're beating around the bush though, because ultimately, at least in my experience, I'm sure in yours as well, a lot of these patients we will never see, uh, at least until they uh, transform the. Uh, majority of them will be uh, managed almost exclusively by our surgical and radiotherapy colleagues. Very rarely do you have these people come to us asking for chemotherapy. Grade 3 CNS cancers, on the other hand, are a completely different kettle of fish. So would you like to illuminate us on that? I would love to, Michael. And I think for this episode, we're probably going to stop at high-grade gliomas. So we will separate it that way. And that way we will move to our next episode just so you can kind of take all this in grade three astrocytomas they are the most common group of infiltrating primary brain tumors in adults the astrocytomas idh mutant cns who grade three this terminology is terrible which was previously an idh mutant anaplastic astrocytoma so they've got rid of the anaplastic nomenclature they differ from grade two by the following. So they've got higher cellularity, more marked nuclear atypia, which means they look worse, and hyperchromasia where they've got different staining and lots of activity when it comes to the mitosis or the reproduction of the cell. Approximately for the grade three, survival is nine years. Now, prior to the IDH mutant first wild type era, diffuse astrocytomas were heterogeneous. They were unpredictable. People didn't know how long you were going to live. They didn't know if you were going to respond to treatment. And this actually really helps with prognostic accuracy, which we mentioned before. So if you have a high IDH mutant astrocytoma grade two, life expectancy is 12 years. If you've got an IDH mutant astrocytoma grade three, your life expectancy is up to 10 years. And if you've got a grade four, it's three to four years. IDH mutant astrocytomas, there will be a short period of clinical and radiological stability after therapy. And as I said, that can range up to 10 years, but it can be as short as one to two years. Tumor growth accelerates in the time between subsequent recurrences. So if you've got someone that had a debulking that had some treatment, and they do this once or twice, they, it's going to come back sooner. So how do you treat these people? Um, so first of all, maximal safe resection. So surgery is key here. Do Does everyone have a complete resection? No. You need surgical planning, MRI as your gold standard here. And then the timing of the surgery, you have to figure out, yeah, are they symptomatic? Is this urgent? You know, are there features concerning for high grades of histology? You know, what's their morbidity what's their likelihood of recovering as well and then what's the extent of resection that you're likely to get you know is biopsying what you need because they're just not going to be able to tolerate it and of course after all this you've got post-operatively so you've had the mri you've had the surgery then you might have radiotherapy and as michael said either pcv or temozolomide in this particular case which does improve survival but will you give radiotherapy alone it's, it's confusing, but it's there. So that's kind of the breakdown of how I think about it is that 
you want to operate, you want to do it safely. And then once you've done that, you need to figure out well, after the biopsy, you'll figure out exactly how you're best going to treat it. Now issue, this is when we run into a lot of issues with primary brain tumors, right? Because they've changed the classification and by changing the classification, it's difficult to apply existing research to new classification because you know what we thought was previous doesn't necessarily correlate to now and you know if we didn't look at idh mutant then of course you know you're not going to be able to know the difference as an example michael spoke about pcv but i'm going to talk a little bit about temozolomide now these are pcv and temozolomide i think are both very old drugs temozolomide has been around for 20 years plus has there been a huge advancement in brain tumors no but this is the EORTC, also known as CATNON, so a slightly catchier trial, where 750 patients were newly diagnosed anaplastic gliomas with IDH mutant or wild type were assigned to one of four treatments. So treatment one, radiotherapy. Treatment two, radiotherapy and TMZ. Treatment three, radiotherapy plus TMZ, plus then 12 months of adjuvant TMZ. And then treatment four, was radiotherapy plus 12 cycles of adjuvant TMZ. Are you confused? Very understandable. Four arms, different regimens of temozolomide, as an example. That's probably what you need to know. And it's radiotherapy versus those three different variations. They had a follow-up of 56 months, and they found that adjuvant TMZ improved median survival compared to no TMZ in the overall population. So 82 versus 47 months with a hazard ratio. We got hazard ratios, Mikey. Hazard ratio of 0.64. The benefit... Oh, you know it's an oncology for the inquisitive <laughs> mind episode when you have hazard ratios. Yes. The benefit was observed in IDH mutant tumors or 117 versus 78 months with a hazard ratio of 0.48 and not in the IDH wild type. So that's where we understand the mutant IDH do better. Concurrently, TMZ did not improve overall survival in the overall population, although there was a non-significant trend towards IDH mutant tumors. Um, so what that means is that, yes, mutant tumors are likely to have some form of overall survival, but they wasn't statistically significant based on the statistics gods. Um, <laughs> and then uh, a great, the other thing to talk about is chemotherapy alone has not shown improvement in survival compared to radiotherapy alone in newly diagnosed grade two or grade three diffuse gliomas. Now there's a trend, but you can't definitively say it. Well, I think to wrap it up, Josh, I might talk about the last non, non-high non grade glioma cancer, which is the oligodendroglioma. Sounds good. Let's hear it. Oligodendrogliomas are basically uh, cancers that uh, were previously called anaplastic oligodendrogliomas but these are grade three idh mutant you remember that's the subtype between uh gliomas and non-gliomas uh, or high-grade gliomas and non-high-grade gliomas uh which demonstrate increased cellularity pleomorphism and uh identifiable mitotic activity and macrovas- microvascular proliferation before we had IDH, before we had the ability to identify IDH, uh, grade 3 oligodendrogliomas were associated with a shorter median survival compared with grade 2, their grade 2 equivalents, which I guess sort of makes sense. Uh, they are also associated with a 1P19Q co-deletion. And if you're asking me what that is before today, I would have had no idea. But now I can tell you that the co-deletion is a a genetic deletion that actually leads to the inactivation of tumor suppressor genes on the 1P, so that's an arm of the uh, first chromosome, and the 19Q chromosome as well. And these are the presence or absence of this deletion allows us to ding- distinguish oligodendrogliomas from astrocytomas because that remember they both carry the IDH mutation but this is some uh, this is one of the ways we can differentiate M- Mikey could you describe it it's a bit like losing the brake in your car so if you have this deletion you don't have a brake and you're just going to move forward or you're going to replicate a lot it is it's sort of like I'm trying to think of a metaphor. A tap that you can't turn off. 
that's good. I, I, I do like that. It's like a tap that you can't turn off and it if you just leave it on, then it's going to overflow and the puddle, much like the oligodendroglioma, is going to spread. And I think that's the first time ever that a brain cancer has been compared to a puddle, Josh. Yep, and probably the last time. <laughs> uh, probably the last time as well. We know that these uh, the grade 3 oligodendroglioma uh, oligodendrogliomas are associated with a shorter median survival, or I should say we did know, because with IDH mutant 1P slash 19Q cotyledid oligodendrogliomas, we still actually don't know the difference or the significance between a cancer being grade 2 versus a cancer being grade 3. So we don't know what prognostic value that differentiation has. However, Josh gave a quite grim summary of the higher grade astrocytomas. Oligodendrogliomas, fortunately, and fortunately is obviously a relative term, they are associated with a better response to radiotherapy and chemotherapy compared with other adult type diffuse gliomas, with a median survival of approximately 15 to 20 years with standard treatment. And Josh, I hear you asking, what is that standard treatment? Oh, tell me, Michael, what is that standard treatment you say? What is the standard treatment? Well, there are a lot of characters that we've seen in this story before. So uh, the EORTC 26951, as distinct from the... As distinct from the EORTC 22845 study, so this was a study of uh, anaplastic oligodendrogliomas, remember that is the old terminology, um, which uh, compared uh, patients either receiving radiotherapy alone or radiotherapy followed by six cycles of our old friend adjuvant PCV, procarbazine, vincristine, and lamustine. Primary endpoints were overall survival and progression-free survival, and again, we're doing this very briefly, but the follow-up was 140 months, which is a little under seven years. So 368 patients were enrolled, and the overall survival in the intervention arm, that's with the PCV, is significantly longer at 42 months, versus 30.6 months in the radiotherapy alone arm with the hazard ratio. There we are again, Josh. We're uh, in our uh, comfort zone now of 0.75. There was a sort of post-hoc analysis of 80 patients with a 1P19Q codilation and overall survival demonstrated a trend to increased benefit. Um, But the overall survival, where the overall survival was not reached in the Uh, combination group, chemo and radiotherapy, versus 112 months in the radiotherapy alone group. However, this did not reach statistical significance. So again, radiotherapy is good. Radiotherapy plus chemotherapy is probably better. But you are having... uh, You can tell that there are a couple of outliers in this study because the follow-up was 140 months, whereas the overall survival was uh, less than a third of that. Michael... Since it's been such a complex episode, do we want to summarize what we've spoken about and give a you know two minute synopsis of astrocytomas and oligodendrocytes or dendrocytomas as well, oligodendrocytes as well? I think that's a very good idea, Josh, because we have been throwing a lot of even more inscrutable information around than usual. Exactly. So I think I will talk a little bit about expected survivals. So what we do know is that oligodendrogliomas have better overall survival than their astrocytoma cousins. The higher the grade, the worse the overall survival. And people that are MGMT methylated are going to respond better to treatment versus MGMT unmethylated. And there's a huge association that you know, IDH mutant um, uh, GBMs are also showing methylation in the MGMT promoters. When we talk about treatments, you know, we as oncologists probably won't see a lot of low-grade gliomas. Um, And Michael was so kind of us to talk about grade one. They're usually curable by surgery alone, but they're slow onset and will generally present with 
seizures. How am I going so far with the summary, Marky? It's becoming more and more scrutable with every passing word. Josh, keep going. Thank you, thank you. I, I love the encouragement. And the thing with the low-grade glioma is they can transform. And when they transform, we're likely going to see them at that point. And that can, that can happen in up to 50% of patients. So that's pretty high. Next moving, we move up a notch. So grade two gliomas. Surgery, again, once again, is the backbone. And, you know, the goal is sort of maximal safety, sort of to delay progression, relieve symptoms, diagnosis, all those sorts of things as well. With a median follow-up of 11.9 years, radiotherapy plus PCV improved both progression, free survival, and overall survival compared to radiotherapy alone in these grade two low-grade gliomas. Let's move to grade three. Grade three astrocytomas, you get higher in the grades, you get lower in the life expectancy. And pre the IDH era, it was all very confusing and no one really understood anything about how long people would live. Again, treatment includes maximal safety surgical resection, and you want to give radiotherapy plus chemotherapy. While there was no statistical overall survival benefit, there was definitely a trend. And then Michael was so nice to talk about oligodendrogliomas, which is the nicer of the tumors where people can live up to 20 plus years after treatment. Now, there weren't any specific trials for the oligodendrogliomas. There were some things for the anaplastic equivalent, which was the pre-changing of the terminology. And what they found overall survival in the intervention arm, which was, if you remember, it was adjuvant PCV with radiotherapy, was significantly longer um, versus radiotherapy alone with a hazard ratio of 0.75. That's a great summary, Josh. And uh, again, we very much understand that this is a difficult topic to visualize especially in audio format so there will be a sort of supplemental resources in the episode description for your viewing pleasure not just your listening pleasure this time around well we hope you enjoyed this episode we know it was a bit of a bit of a mouthful as it was for both michael and i but if you take a couple of just singular points hopefully when you do a neuro-oncology rotation or even if you never end up doing but you might sort of have some idea about prognosis and that there are some treatment available, but a lot of the time these things do recur. So Michael, what are we going to talk about next week? Well, I think we're going to keep on the uh, CNS neuro-onc train, Josh, because we have left out one major player in this episode. And that is, that is the big one. That is the elephant in the room. That is the high-grade gliomas, of which the crown jewel is the glioblastoma multiform. So we will talk about the classification, the appearance, the terrible prognosis, and some of the very few high points in terms of uh, development of treatment modalities and strategies in tackling this awful, awful disease. So what I'm saying, Josh, is it's going to be a very typically light-hearted, fuzzy, <laughs> rainbows and rabbits-filled episode of Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind. And if that hasn't turned off our listeners, we hope to see you then. All right, see you then. <laughs>